dictator agents in acute coronary syndrome. Um, just a quick uh, declaration of conflict of interest. I'm sorry I didn't put it up on the slide, but I was on the advisory board for Tikagre Law and ACS in Singapore. So let's start with a case scenario. So this is a real patient of mine. He's about 40 years old. I can't remember exactly how old he was, but uh, many a few years ago he came with an acute inferior standing. So he underwent primary PCI as uh, per usual protocol. We put in a band macro stand for him. A few months later he came back with chest pain and he had an instant stenosis of the um, uh, stand, and we put in a drug eluding stand. Within a week he came back with acute subacute stand thrombosis. And then we did some more ballooning and uh, uh, aspirated the clot. And then a year later, he came with another STEMI uh, in a different place, but also in the right coronary artery. We put in another bare metal stand. And then a few months later, he came with another MI and had another instant restenosis of this, this new bare metal stand. And uh, again, we put in a drug eluting stand this time. And as, as expected, a few days later, he came in with another STEMI from stent thrombosis. So we do have patients like this that, uh, no matter what we do, they are very thrombotic and they keep coming in with these uh, thrombotic events. So the question is, can we reduce these kind of recurrent thrombotic events in, in patients like this? At the same time, for elderly patients, thinking about how we can manage the bleeding risk. So an acute coronary syndrome, as we all know, is a thrombotic event. This is the, the right coronary artery bef bef uh, in the inferior STEMI with a totally occluded artery, and this is after, yeah? And what we suck out is this, and this is the enemy, okay? And this is what we are, we're gonna talk about today when we talk about uh, antiplatelet uh, therapy. So the pathophysiology of arthrothrombosis, we won't go in very detailed into this, but um, basically it all starts with a, a plug erosion or a ruptured plug, and then the whole uh, platelet activation as well as coagulation uh, cascade gets activated um, there are various medications that has uh, 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 come up in the market or in, in research to try and tackle this problem of uh, thrombosis. What we know very commonly is aspirin, which is a COX-1 inhibitor. It reduces the levels of thromboxane A2, which is a very potent uh, activator of platelets. And then we've got the tinopyridines, ticlopidin, clopidogrel, prasugrel, Tangrelor, uh, as well as uh, uh, Ticagrelor, which is not a tinopyridine, but all these drugs actually block the ADP receptor, the P2Y12 receptor, and that again uh, reduces platelet activation. And then we've got anticoagulants, we've got uh, thrombin inhibitors, and we've got glycoprotein 2B3A uh, inhibitors. Okay? If we uh, go through all of this today, we'll, we'll, we won't have lunch. So I'm just going to concentrate on uh, the antiplatelets. Uh, just a quick note on Cangrelor and Vorepazar. Uh, these drugs have been, haven't been proven to be uh, uh, efficacious in their randomized trials, so we won't talk about them. Um, for glycoprotein 2B3A, uh, it's just a complicated topic, uh, and we, we won't go into that as well. Okay? So essentially, we'll talk about aspirin, clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor today. So aspirin, as we all know, I've just got one slide on this. There's a 30% uh, relative risk reduction in patients with acute myocardial infarction. This is data from the uh, uh, meta-analysis from the uh, anti-thrombotic trialists. Uh, not all the patients receive aspirin, but about 80 to 85% of these patients receive aspirin. So there was about a 30% relative risk reduction. So we all know patients who come in with acute coronary syndrome, we need to give them aspirin as soon as possible. Aspirin works very rapidly to reduce the levels of thromboxane A2. Um, and then there is this whole group of drugs called the P2Y12 or ADP receptor blockers. Now, they are split into two categories. One category are the tinopyridines. These are non-reversible -re blockers of these uh, P2Y12 uh, uh, receptors. Um, that means that when they attach themselves to this receptor on the platelet, uh, the platelets will have no function for the rest of its life. Okay. Whereas um, ticagrelor is a reversible uh, inhibitor, so um, after a certain period of time, the platelet can regain its function again. Okay. We won't talk about ticlopidin because this drug is generally not used today due to the side effects of uh, uh, thrombocytopenia. Um, so mainly clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor. 
Just a few slides on clopidogrel. We all know this drug very well. You've been giving it in the A&E, uh, loading patients with uh, acute coronary syndrome. Basically, one of the landmark trials was the CURE trial, looking at patients uh, both getting medical treatment as well as uh, uh, invasive treatment. Um, 12,500 patients. Basically, clopidogrel gave about a 20% uh, risk reduction uh, added on to aspirin. So this is dual antiplatelet therapy. Okay. The benefit was seen both in the medical group as well as the PCI group, not so much in the CABG group. Okay, so this we all know we've been using this drug for quite long. There was an increase in major bleeding as well as minor bleeding in the clopidogrel group uh, compared to placebo plus aspirin. Um, and we know this as well. Now the problem with clopidogrel is that uh, firstly, the... the, the um, the, it's, it's a pro-drug, so it needs to be activated into its active metabolite for it to be effective. So um, the time of onset of action takes time, and therefore there have been various trials that have come up with uh, different regimes of loading doses. We won't go into that, but essentially 600 milligrams if you're going to do uh, intervention within 24 hours. Okay, so it's, there's slow variable transformation to the active metabolite, there is modest and variable platelet inhibition, increased risk of bleeding as we saw earlier, risk of stent thrombosis and MI in poor responders. So we know that there is a genetic polymorphism in patients who receive, uh, what, how, in, in how patients respond to clopidogrel. And about 20 to 25% of patients have been found to be poor responders. And so there is a need for a better antiplatelet uh, to, to replace all uh, to, to be better than clopidogrel. So, there are two new antiplatelets in the market and I think we are, we've all heard of these uh, drugs. The first drug that we talk about is prasugrel. Prasugrel is also a tinopyridine, but it has very efficient generation of active metabolite. It has high levels of... Uh, IPA stands for uh, uh, inhibition of platelet aggregation. And this is achieved rapidly, and it has high inhibition of pillar aggregation in clopidogrel hyporesponders. So the landmark trial for this trial, basically th there's two drugs, prasugrel and ticagrelor, they have one each uh, randomized control trial that got them uh, their FDA approval. Uh, Triton Timi 38 was the study for prasugrel. And this looked at a cohort of acute coronary syndromes patients STEMI or moderate to high risk unstable angina and STEMI. Uh, and one important point is that these patients must be planned for PCI. Okay? So it was a double blinder study. Uh, everybody got aspirin, one arm got clopidogrel, 300 milligrams loading dose, and 75 milligrams OM uh, of maintenance. And the other arm got plasugrel, 60 milligrams loading dose, 10 milligrams uh, maintenance. Primary endpoint was CV death, MI, and stroke, and safety endpoint was major bleeding. Okay, so this is important to remember because uh, I think most of us will tend to compare between this drug prasugrel and ticagrelor. And the study design for both uh, uh, drugs were relatively similar. So I'm just going to point out what was different. For prasugrel, these were high risk patients, uh, STEMI patients, uh, either less than 14 days with ischemia or going for primary PCI. But the thing is that in this study, the coronary anatomy needed to be known, okay, for the for and STEMI patients. For STEMI patients, which is about 25% of the study population, uh, the drug could be loaded uh, uh, upfront before coronary angiogram was done. However, for the other patients, the 75% of the rest of the patients, the drug was only given after coronary anatomy was uh, uh, known. Okay, and you know that you're going to proceed to PCI. The major exclusion criteria was severe comorbidity, increased bleeding risk, prior ICH or, or hemorrhagic stroke, and any tinopyridine within five days. So if the patient was on clopidogrel or ticlopidine, they will be excluded from this study. Okay, so this is again an important point for this study. The primary endpoint of CV death, MI, and stroke was reduced significantly in the prasugrel group. The, the graph diverged very early on, so there was a significant uh, 
that, that's about 20, 23% reduction within the first 30 days and about 20% reduction within the 90 days and 19% reduction at the end of about 15 months. Okay? The risk of stent thrombosis was markedly reduced. Okay? That's the uh, one, one strong point for this drug is that there was 50%, about 50% reduction of stent thrombosis. And that's important to interventional cardiologists <laughs> like us because you know, when stent thrombosis happens, there's always a certain amount of guilt that we feel. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's important for us. However, uh, for the safety outcomes, um, when we looked at bleeding at 15 months, Prasugrel has significantly more bleeding, both major non-CABG as well as a combination of major and minor. And if we look at the benefit of uh, a 19% at 15 months, minus the, risk, the, the, the increased risk of bleeding, the net clinical benefit uh, was about only 13% at 15 months. Okay, so because of the increased risk of bleeding, the net benefit was reduced. If we look at the subgroup analysis in this trial, um, what we can see is that in STEMI patients, they seem to do better than the, the, the uh, uh, NSTEMI or unstable angina patients. Males were more than females, better than females, but in, in, general, in general patients with AMI, uh, females do worse than, than males. Those who were younger did better, and those who were diabetics did very well. In fact, if you look at the sub-analysis of the diabetic population, the efficacy or the primary endpoint of CD death, MI, and stroke was reduced much more than the general cohort, and the risk of bleeding was actually similar. Okay? There was no increase of risk of bleeding in the diabetic subgroup. Of course, the study is not powered for this, this sub-analysis. Um, if you look at the net clinical benefit, i.e. I. the reduction in ischemic events minus the bleeding risk. Basically, if you had a prior stroke, you would do badly on prasugrel, you do better than in, in the clopidogrel group. If you're more than 75 years old, you also do better, uh, you don't do as well as uh, the general cohort in the prasugrel group. And if you are a small size patient, less than 60 kilograms, you also don't do as well. So, Essentially, prasugrel's indication is only for acute coronary syndrome patients and only if they're going for PCI or you've already planned to do PCI. The greatest benefit are in diabetics, STEMI patients, as well as stent thrombosis reduction. And the highest bleeding risk are in elderly more than 75 years old, low body weight less than 60 kilograms, patients with previous CVA, TIA, or intracranial So, in giving these drugs, the, the, you, you really need to um, filter out patients who uh, are so-called relatively contraindicated because these, these patients will not benefit as much from this drug compared to giving, just giving them clopidogrel. Okay. What about ticagrelor? Ticagrelor is a new class, I won't even read this, but uh, it's direct acting, it's not a pro-drug, it acts reversibly as we talked about uh, earlier. Um, so, after the drug wears out, the platelet's um, function can improve. Um, it doesn't require metabolic activation, uh, and, and therefore it has a rapid uh, action. So, this is a, a, a pharmacokinetic, pharmacokinetic study of uh, its, its uh, inhibition of platelet aggregation. Essentially, the, the, the white White line uh, represents clopidogrel, the yellow one represents uh, ticagrelor. And there's a very rapid onset of action, similar with prasugrel, okay, similar with prasugrel. Um, and uh, at about one hour, it already has 50% IPA, which is about the same as clopidogrel at four hours. Okay, and at four hours, obviously, it is almost double uh, as effective as clopidogrel, okay. So the randomized control trial for this drug is PLATO, and the study design is very similar to uh, Prasugrel's study design, except that these were patients who could undergo medical therapy, PCI or CABG, and they could be clopidogrel treated or naive. So if they've already on, been on long-term clopidogrel, they could still be enrolled into this study. Two arms clopidogrel loading and maintenance, Tigagrelo, 180 milligrams loading, 19 milligrams PD maintenance, the endpoint is similar, CV death, MI or stroke, and the uh, safety endpoint is major bleeding. So, um, again, similarly, 
there was significant benefit in uh, ticagrelor versus clopidogrel. The relative risk reduction was 16%. However, uh, okay, and, and also it reduced the risk of, Plato is the study for ticagrelor, Triton Timmy 38 is for prasugrel, and there was also a reduction in the risk of stent thrombosis, although not, this is not a, a, a head to head trial, but just looking at the numbers, it was not as potent as uh, prasugrel in reducing stent thrombosis. The major bleeding events, though, were a little bit different. Okay, and I, and I uh, play some slides here to compare the difference between prasugrel and tetagrelor. In the prasugrel uh, uh, study, basically we know there was an increased uh, non CAVG bleeding. Um, but if you look at the major bleeding, there was a significant increase. But if you look at the life-threatening and fatal bleeding, there was also a significant increase. In fact, for fatal bleeding, it was almost four times uh, compared to clopidogrel. However, in Ticagra law, overall, there was no increase in major bleeding events. Overall, there was no, significantly, there was no increase in fatal bleeding. However, if you look at the non-CABG major bleeding, which is a better reflection of how uh, 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 an, an anti-thrombotic or anti-platelet drug uh, will fare, because in, when the patients go for CABG, there are various uh, compounding factors for bleeding. When you looked at the non-CABG bleeding, Ticagrelor still had a significantly increased rate of bleeding. Um, however, importantly, we should think about fatal bleeding. Now, fatal bleeding was similar in both groups, in Ticagrelor and Clopidogrel group. However, in the Ticagrelor group, more commonly the fatal bleeding was attributed to intracranial bleed. And in the Clopidogrel group, more commonly it was due to GI bleed. Okay, so fatal intracranial bleeds was significantly more common in patients with Ticagrelor, although overall the fatal bleeds were the same between the two arms. Uh, so one of the contraindications of Ticagrelor would be patients with previous intracranial bleeds, because in this study, both in the Clopidogrel and the Ticagrelor group, uh, we saw an increased risk of intracranial bleed if they had an intracranial bleed before. Okay? Uh, just a quick one, Ticagrelor has also some unique side effects because of uh, increase in the adenosine levels uh, in the body. Um, patients do complain of some dyspnea. Uh, I suppose when they come to A&E, sometimes after PCI, they are on Ticagrelor. Sometimes they feel this funny, so it's like asthma, they, they feel this strange kind of breathlessness, they need to take a deep breath occasionally, it's not exertion related. And so this is one of the differential diagnoses when you see them in ED, that it may be due to side effects from Ticagrelor. They also had, uh, there was a significantly increased uh, a rate of ventricular pauses in these patients. However, if you look at pacemaker insertion, syncope, bradycardia or heart block, there was no uh, statistically significant uh, increase. So it's all this is due to the adenosine effect that Ticagrelor has. So, in summary, Ticagrelor showed benefit in all ACS patients, including medically treated patients. Now, this is different from Prasugra, where it's only for PCI patients. Okay? Upfront loading for all patients, including patients that were already previously on clopidogrel, is okay. No absolute, absolute contraindication except in patients with previous intracranial bleed. Okay? And you need to be cautious in patients with significant bradycardia, or patients who have asthma or COPD. So should our first patient receive one of these newer antiplatelets? And the answer for me is uh, definitely yes. Um, however, the, the different uh, um, cardiac society bodies uh, globally have slightly different uh, recommendations. The Europeans recommend that Ticagrelor be used as a first line for all patients regardless of initial uh, treat, uh, treatment or whether they were pre-treated with clopidogrel. Prasugrel is also recommended, but only for patients who are going for PCI and they must not have all these high risk of uh, life threatening bleed, for example, weight less than 60, age more than 75, and so on. Clopidogrel, however, has been relegated to a second line only if patients cannot receive tricagrelor or prasugrel. However, the Americans have not uh, made such similar recommendations. Basically, um, for their PCI guidelines, they say you can either you can use any of the three drugs. They, uh, refrain from recommending one over the other. So which antiplatelet for which patient? Now, um, when, when, when we give the patient a certain drug, we always think about what is their risk of ischemic events in the future. However, um, 
when you look at the risk of ischemic events, much of, many of them are similar to the risk of bleeding complications as well. So it's not so easy. So some of the considerations for interventions, we think about how the stenting went. Okay? Did we put two overlapping stents? Did we do very complex stenting? Was it a very calcified lesion? We didn't dilate properly. Is the stent in the left main? Um, and if the patient is at high risk of dying from a stent thrombosis, generally I would give them uh, the new drugs. Risk of bleeding, of course, we need to think about contraindications to the anticoagulant, compliance and cost. Now, this is an issue in Singapore because in Singapore, for a subsidized patient, a month, a month uh, of clopidogrel is probably cheaper than a day of ticagrelor or prasugrel. So, um, so it's a big difference to the patient. So this is something that we are kind of uh, we need to think about. So ideally, you should give everybody the new antiplatelet, except those with contraindications. But in Singapore, it's not so easy. Overall, prasugrel and ticagrelor is superior to clopidogrel in reducing ischemic events. Bleeding risk is increased. Ticagrelor can be administered in most patients except those with ICH. Prasugrel reserved only for ACS patients who are going for PCI, and that a balanced approach is needed to in, needed considering bleeding risk as well as the cost. Okay, thanks. <laughs>